Suzanne. Um, I was honored to be invited to speak here tonight, honored months ago, um, and asked Suzanne what, what should I talk about, and she said, hey, how about uh, winter wellness? And I said, oh, what a great concept or topic to speak on, because I am a licensed acupuncturist, and if you're familiar at all with Chinese medicine, one of the basic tenets of it is that we as human beings are an integral part of the natural world. We are the microcosm of the macrocosm. We are a piece, a, a piece of the larger whole. And so with that being said, I want to introduce to you another concept of traditional Chinese medicine, and that's the five element theory. And so here on the board, you'll see that I have the five elements kind of written out here. So we have wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. Water being the last one, and water is the element that we're talking about tonight with winter wellness. So here we are in November, and it's fall. Why are we talking about winter in the fall? Well, it's actually, this is a really, uh, awesome time to be talking about winter wellness because this is a really good time to begin to prepare to dive deep into the depths of winter. This is a good time to start thinking about really boosting your immune system as we just had our time change. The days are getting shorter, the nights are getting colder, the environment's going to start to get more damp. And so coldness and dampness, right, those things can kind of set into our systems and cause a lot of imbalance if we're not prepared. If we are prepared, then it can actually offer us many, many gifts. So that's my hope tonight is to just present a really elegant, simple tips and tools for you to dive into the depths of winter in a way that you can maintain your health and just conserve energy and store energy and really take time to rest and retreat, get to know yourself better and just honor all of the opportunities that you have within yourself and within your environment to heal so that when we get into spring, we can spring forward and just like burst forth with all of the amazing gifts that we have. So fall, the fall, the other thing about the fall is that the fall is mostly connected with the metal element. And the, each of the elements have an organ associated with them. And the organs associated with metal are the lung and the large intestine. The large intestine, we gather all the nutrients from the harvest, right? Right now we're harvesting the last of our summer crops and some of our fall and winter crops are starting to come in. If you're a gardener, you might have put your cabbage into the ground and your garlics into the ground and you might be enjoying the squashes and um, some of those awesome late summer produce. Um, it's kind of at the end of that. So we're really using our large intestine to get that, the nutrients to head into winter. And then it's also, the metal element is also associated with the fall and the lung. And the lung in Chinese medicine is actually a really important organ because the energy of it supports an energetic system that we have in our body called the Wei Qi. Wei, W-E-I, Qi, Q-I. And that's, that that's Chinese, but it translates into protective field or protective energy. And so we ha it's, it's similar to our immune system and our lymph system. And we have this energetic field that exists all around our whole entire body. And it is about an eighth of an inch above the skin and an eighth of an inch into the skin. And the Wei Qi, that energy, circulates around our body. And we want to keep that force field really nice and strong and solid so that if the pathogens, the external pathogens, come in, come towards us, we want to be able to reflect them so they don't come into our body and get into our organs and cause disharmony on a deeper level. So we have that energetic system that's associated with the metal element, right? And you see, right, I started with wood, fire, earth, metal is where we're at right now in the fall, and then we're heading into the winter time. And go figure, the winter time would be associated with water. That makes perfect sense 
because what happens in the winter? It rains, it gets damp. And so the water element is the winter. So here we are in the winter. And the first thing on the handout is a poem by John Seuss, and it's actually in one of my favorite books. This is called Earth Prayers. I don't know if you've seen this book, but it's really awesome. And it's in the section of Earth Prayers called Cycles of Life. And the poem reads, to be of the earth is to know the restlessness of being a seed, the darkness of being planted, the struggle toward the light, the joy of bursting forth, the love of bearing food for someone, the scattering of your seeds, the decay of the seasons, the mystery of death, and the miracle of birth. And so you could see that Things in nature are cyclical, much like they are in our lives. So where are we at in the cycle of our lives right now? We're, um, you know, the veil's really thin. We just celebrated Dia de los Muertos. This is a time where there is a lot of introspection and kind of this like tenderness as we head into this time that, you know, it's cold, so we want to wrap ourselves up in scarves and kind of just start to really hunker down for the winter so that we can conserve our energy and just bite down and chew and receive the nourishment from the harvest. And so winter, right? What happens in winter in nature happens in our bodies. And what happens in winter? Well, let's see, the fall just happened, so the, all the trees are leaving, losing their leaves right now. But what's going to be happening is that because there's not going to be a lot of leaves and above ground activity going on, the roots are just going to be riotous. The roots are going to be celebrating and storing all of this awesome energy that it's got that they've received from the sunlight and all of the energy and love that's been happening in the atmosphere. It condenses into the roots. So we're moving into the time of water, winter. And so what happens in the winter, right? That happens in the winter. All the energy comes into the roots and it starts raining and there's water. And what happens in our body? Well, our body is 60% water. More than half of our bodies, on average, is water. And so this is, a, this is one of my, one of, I think one of the most interesting elements because water is so interesting. It can like break down a rock and it can move around whatever it encounters and it can be contained and it can be a vapor and it can be ice. So this water is this dynamic fluid and static. It's kind of like everything all at once and nothing all at the same time. Water. And then water, winter, right? In the five element theory, each of these elements can be related to anything in nature. A sound, a smell, a grain, a number, a season, right? And so the organs associated with metal, I mentioned earlier, were the lung and the large intestine. And with water, the organs associated with water are the kidney and the bladder. All right, and that makes sense, right? Those are kind of like really watery organs. The kidney, let's talk about the kidney for a moment. What does the kidney do? Well, in Western medicine, the kidney is closely associated with water metabolism, and water metabolism also helps with the um, function of the heart and blood pressure. So kidney and heart have and the heart is the fire element, right? So we have water and fire, that relationship. Um, right, they're kind of opposites. They can extinguish each other or um, turn one into vapor, right? They have this really dynamic relationship. And so the kidney, in Western medicine, that is, that is the function of the kidney in Western medicine. And in Eastern medicine or traditional Chinese medicine, the function of the kidney is much more energetic. It's a little bit more esoteric. And the energy of the kidney in Chinese medicine, it dominates the ears, hearing. It dominates the bones, which includes the teeth. And then it also 
dominates the, which I think is really interesting, the brain or the marrow, or it dominates the marrow. And the brain is considered marrow in Chinese medicine because the brain is enclosed in the skull, in the cranium. And then also the spinal cord that comes down is also enclosed within each vertebrae. And so that's considered marrow as well. And so the kidney, the winter time, there's this really close association with mental health, and with the nervous system as well, right? The nervous system is very much an electrical system, and the water in our bodies helps for those electrical um, firings to happen. It gives it kind of like a base for that to happen. The reproductive organs, right? The kidneys, if you can feel the bottom level of your rib cage, and then you go back into your back, the kidneys are housed right there. And they're actually really tiny, they're pretty small. And they have a little adrenal on top, of, adrenal gland on top of them that looks like a little acorn hat on top of an acorn, actually. So, that, so we have these two little kidneys in our back. And um, the kidneys, the energy of the kidney is very much, it's kind of like a pilot light for our body. So the kidneys are this little tiny pilot light, the Mingmen fire, if you've ever done any like Qigong or Chinese medicine, Chinese exercises, you rub the bottom of the belly to like keep that area warm and you rub the back, the low back to keep it warm because you want to keep that pilot light ignited. And so what does that do, right? The kidney's in charge of water metabolism. And so that little pilot light allows the moisture to come into the kidneys, and then the kidneys filter the water, right? They have the nephrons, or not, yeah, the nephrons are the, yeah, nephrons, that filter the water. And so they separate the pure from the impure. And the impure goes into the bladder, to be excreted out, and then what happens with the pure water that the kidney filters? Well, that little pilot light turns that water into vapor. Mind you, this is all Chinese medical theory. T turns the water into vapor, and then the vapor comes up, and it just mists and lightly moistens and nourishes all of our organs so that they can remain soft and supple, and flexible, moist, so that they can do all the metabolism and all of their jobs that they need to do. If we don't have water, things like you, you see the rivers kind of dry up and it, they, you know, you can look at a dry river and that doesn't look as vibrant and alive and healthy and inviting as a river that has water in it that you just kind of want to dive into. So urinary bladder. Uh, the urinary bladder is the other organ associated with winter in Chinese medicine. And the urinary bladder is this container that receives the impure water from the kidney and then excretes it out. And um, that, you know, it's pretty, the energetics of the urinary bladder are pretty similar in Western and Eastern medicine. So that, those are the functions of the kidney and the urinary bladder. But what happens when, what happens when there's an imbalance? Well, if there's a deficiency in the kidney or the urinary bladder, right? I said that the kidney and urinary bladder, um, they, they dominate the ears. It's the organ that's as closely associated with it. So sometimes if someone has um, tinnitus ringing in the ears, it could be that the kidney, the moisture isn't coming up and nourishing and moistening it. So the physical structure and the energetic structure of the ears gets kind of dry and hard and it's not supple. It can't, re it can't like vibrate and resonate the sound, so it gets kind of rigid. Um, if the kidney and urinary bladder are deficient, the moisture might not come up and um, nourish the brain. A lot of times if there's like uh, forgetfulness or um, you know, like other certain um, disharmonies in Western medicine that present like dementia, Alzheimer's, just that kind of like the brain is slowly starting to slow down in its function. It's not receiving that nourishment from the kidneys. That's kind of like, sometimes it can be the brain like drying out a little bit energetically. The other things that the kidney and bladder 
dominate is the low back and the knees. So a lot of times if there's low back pain or knee pain, it can be related to kidney. And if the kidney and urinary bladder are not healthy and plump and happy, it can also cause a lot of fear. Fear is the emotion of the kidney. Just like these elements are related to an organ, a season, a color, a sound, they're related to an emotion. And so if the kidney can't distribute water properly, it affects the heart, right? So if the kidney's deficient, it can't feed the heart, which is the fire element. And it can contribute to anxiety and fear. And a lot of that, too, has to do with its connection to the brain. So why am I talking about organs? You guys came here to learn about immune system. Um, and you're learning about their reproductive and the, re and the respiratory and all these other systems. Well, they're all really closely interconnected. So I just wanted to give you that as like the, the basis for what Chi how Chinese medicine views the immune system and the winter time. Right? They're very closely connected. I want to talk, um, give you some exercises. Let's see. So in your handout here, let's see, am I, am I keeping on track, you guys? Yes. Emotion, fear, exercise. So some exercises that are really great. So just exercise in general is really great, right? We all need exercise. We all need to move. Because if we're not moving, if we're not exercising, then we get stagnant. And then if we get stagnant, then the energy doesn't move, the water doesn't move, and things start to just slow down and get stuck. And that is a disharmony. Things in nature just move, right? Change is the only constant, so we're constantly changing and moving. And so movement, no matter how wild and big it is, or how small and calm and soothing it is, is really important. So exercise, seasonally is a really interesting thing to think about because in the summertime your exercise might look really rigorous and you know you might do a lot of different dance classes you might it's just so nice out in the mornings before the heat of the day comes in you might just want to go for a really vigorous walk well in the winter time exercise is a little bit different or it should be at least. <laughs> in the winter time, the exercises should be more like really long, slow movements, really um, gentle movements. So in the summertime where you might want to do um, dance and lots of, and just expend a lot of energy because that's the time of a lot of outward growth and a lot of movement and a lot of warmth and a very young in nature. The winter time is kind of the opposite of that. The winter time is very yin in nature. So the winter time we want to kind of slow down and be more gentle with ourselves. And so a really good like nice slow qigong movement or um, a yoga stretch or just instead of a really vigorous walk, you might just want to walk really slowly and just feel your feet on the earth and feel the slow movements, right? Because cold contracts. It's a time of contraction. We want to mirror within our bodies what happens outside of our bodies in the environment. And if you look at all the plants that are our teachers and our friends, they're contracting. They've lost their leaves. Their energy is down in the roots. So we want to mimic nature. Is it really a mimic? I don't know, because we are nature. So it's we just want to be more so than mimic. Um, so slow down, short walks. Um, right. So the first exercise that I listed, and we get to do some exercises. Are you guys ready? <laughs> it's kind of yay, exercise. Um, so the first exercise um, on above, like in addition to all of the ones that I just mentioned that you can do, is to rub your ears. The kidneys open into the ears. So the ears are really important, um, right? The whole body, there's a microsystem where you can treat the whole body just by treating the ears. And you can rub your ears for five minutes a day. And the way I like to do it is to start out with thumbs behind the ears and just go through and get, you know, go, do a good round around the edges of the ears. 
And you might feel your ears start to warm up if you just really get in there and give them a good rub in. They might start to warm up. Are anyone's ears feeling warm? It starts to warm up. Yeah, so that's going to be, do two and a half minutes like that, and then flip your hands the other way <laughs> so you can get the full benefit. And continue rubbing your ears like that. This is actually, um, in Qigong, this is a really important opening exercise to rub your ears. And just really get in there, and, you know, like around the base of the ears. And so the first exercise, yeah, this is a really, this is, I'm going to give you a couple exercises that are really easy and gentle but effective to get energy moving. So I can feel my ears just from that little bit of rubbing, they're warm. They're probably bright red. <laughs> so rubbing your ears, really important. The second one is marching in place. And you can stand up or you can do it right from your seat, whatever's more comfortable for you. But the kidney meridian on the bottom of the foot, the kidney meridian, op the opening point, acupuncture point, is on the bottom of the foot. It's the only acupuncture point that's on the bottom of the foot. And so this is a really interesting element of the kidney meridian, the, the pathway of energy, because it really connects us to the earth. And um, so when we, this, the second exercise is marching in place, right? And this is, so you'll do this, you can rub the ears for five minutes and then you can march in place for five minutes. And by marching in place, it's like really just like flat, you can even just tap your feet on the ground, really just f like nice and flat and just feel your whole. And so when I'm doing this, what I'm feeling is I can feel, energy come up the back of my legs and actually I can feel my kidneys kind of vibrating a little bit, right? Can you feel that, Lucy? Like, uh -huh. you can just feel that vibration come up the back of the legs up into the kidneys. Is that part of the sacroiliac area? Yeah, uh-huh. The, sa the sacroiliac is where the sacrum, the sacrum and the iliac crest meet, so right here. If you do have an injury or if, you're, if your low back is, is injured, you might want to be a little bit careful with that. And you can yes. just, just, you know, as lightly, you can even, it can even just be this gentle. But it, so when you're doing this, what you want to practice is just feeling. And even if you just have to imagine it, you want to feel the kidneys kind of vibrating in your low back, right? And what it's doing is you're resonating with the earth, right? So you're getting... Earth's energetic field up into your kidneys. What's that, Marilyn? You want to be barefoot on the earth. Yeah, you barefoot on the earth is probably the best way to be. <laughs> yes, and okay. So, and that actually, okay, you can, let's see, are we going to stand up for, oh yeah, so while, we're, while I have you all up, let's l do the next one. Um, but that brings up a good point, Marilyn, is that there is an actual um, exercise called earthing, where you stand on the earth. And it's really important because just like we have an energetic field around us, the earth does too. And that's like through this acupuncture point on the bottom of the foot, that's how we connect into that. And it's really important for our energetic electrical chi system to connect with it because we're all one, right? So. The next one is um, vigorously rubbing the kidneys, right? So I said that if you find the bottom of your rib cage and you just go straight to the back, your kidneys are right here. And so what you want to do is just vigorously rub them. Again, kind of like the ear got warm, you want to feel that warmth in your low back. And this keeps the kidneys warm. The kidneys like to be warm. Getting back. The heating pad, hot water bottle, vigorously rubbing them. Mm, feels so good. The kidneys do like to be warm. It helps them to function. It helps them to transform the water. It helps them to move the impurities out of our body, right? So this is really important. Um, and then the next one, it's a qigong exercise called the counter swing or the qi swing. And I'm going to do it kind of big so you could see, but you can, if you want to practice it right now, you can do it kind of smaller, and then on your own, you can go bigger with it. Oh, dance. It's kind of a, it's kind of a dance, yeah. So you're going to, you stand, and you keep your waist straight, and you're just going to twist, just, just twist at the waist, kind of like you're wringing out the top of the body, right? You're just wringing it out. And if you just do that, you'll see that you're, right, I'm going to be exaggerative here. You'll see that your arms start to swing out, right? Notice I'm not moving my knees. I'm just moving my waist. La, la, la. My knees do bend a little bit. And so see how my arms are, I'm kind of flinging my arms out, and they're kind of, 
they're hitting, they're lightly tapping rather, the front and the back of the kidneys. Yeah, lightly tapping, right? So front and the back. So you can see it from the back how I'm kind of just like just moving my waist and my hands fly up and they tap where the kidneys are. So you're getting, this is like a two for one deal here, right? You're get, not only are you like wringing out the kidneys, you're also kind of tapping them. And so you're really giving your internal organs a massage, which is great because what happens in the winter, things contract and slow down. And massage is great, right, Lucy? <laughs> Yeah, so that's a great way to just give your kidneys a little bit more love. Keep that warmth, keep that movement happening in there. So, question for you. Yes. Yeah, great question. Hot tubs are awesome. So, the thing with hot tubs that you want to be um, aware of is that when you get out of the hot tub, your body is in a warm state and it's open. And so that, that gives the opportunity for cold and pathogens to come into the body. So you want to be able to just get out and immediately be covered up. Don't let your body be exposed to cold wind, cold damp, right? So here's the other thing is that you do want to expose your body. This is, this is delicate balance here because you do want to expose your body too cold. Um, like right now, well, when we get into lifestyle, you'll see that there's a suggestion, but right now is a really good time to start taking cold showers because it, it um, or at least end your shower with some cold because it causes a contraction and it actually stimulates the immune system. So cold is good. Which you, and if it's good to cool down after a hot tub. You don't necessarily want to like keep all the heat in. But you don't want to let wind and the dampness kind of get into it. So you, there's, it's, it's a delicate balance, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, great, great question. I love hot tubs. I want one. <laughs> the last exercise that I have listed in there is just take a break. Take time to reflect. Take time to receive the nourishment and really let it sink in. Be like the roots of the tree, you know, like the trees where in the spring and summer and even in the fall, they just have these beautiful flowers and they're all out here. And then in the winter, they're really just receiving nourishment and a lot of the activities happening underground. So you want that to be happening in your body. You want to rest, you want to meditate, you want to journal, you want to do self-reflection. It's a time to really start thinking about that, it, like the poem that I read in the beginning, um, to be of the earth is to know the restlessness of being a seed. You're kind of in that seed stage where you're underground and you have this potential, right? So this is what happens in the winter is that we're calm, we're cool, we're underground, and we just have this potential that we're giving nourishment, we're giving thought, we're giving, and we're conserving and storing and replenishing that energy. So that when we move from metal, which is fall into winter, so that when we move to fall into spring, which is the wood element, we can be like a tree and the flowers, we can just boom, burst forth and kind of be flexible, sway with all the winds that come in our direction. And really, um, yeah, I mean, I know I, in my life there's been winters where um, I was moving or starting a new business or doing all these things and then the spring came and the business started to get busy and I was exhausted. Um, so I can look back and learn from that life experience. Um, actually, I kind of did that this year. I moved in February. But <laughs> I did get to have a lot of um, really rejuvenative time. So, so exercise, some things you can do. Real, right? Simple tools. Any other exercises people like to do in the winter? Anyone have any anything you like to do in the winter? Okay. <laughs> Take a nap. Great. Chi Bo from the Yellow Emperor's Classic of Internal Medicine, which is a really great book. It's this it's one of the, it's thousands of years old and it's this classic of Chinese medicine. I'll get to you. And it's like, the, the way that it's written is like this conversation between Huangdi and Chibo. And then Huangdi is like this 
medis med Chinese medical scholar, and Chibo is his apprentice, and so they're sitting in the forest, and Chibo asks um, Huang Di all these questions, and Huang Di answers him in these very esoteric ways about nature. Chibo is asking him about what do you do in winter, and Huang Di says, well, in winter you go to bed early and rise late. You rise late after the sun has come up and been able to warm the atmosphere. Because if you wake up early when everything's still contracted, your body's still contracted and then you have to get up and move and, and it's, you're rigid still and it's a lot of work. So conserving energy in the winter, really important, yes. I find for myself, whether it's summer, spring, fall, winter, if you're sitting, well, when you are sitting, keep moving. Yeah. I, I put the chair up my feet, I'm going. Yeah. So she says, if you're sitting, keep moving. Always keep movement, even if it's just a really gentle undulation of the spine. Yeah. All right. Yes. Yes. Yes, chair exercises, like that exercise of um, tapping the feet lightly on the floor. You can sit at the edge of your seat and just roll your spine back and forth. All great suggestions. I'm just going to rip through a few here. Uh, other nice, simple tools that you can do. There's some pressure points that you can rub on. The first one is large intestine four, and I've outlined them. And this is a great point. If you've, some people, you might have heard of this one for headaches. This point is the command point of the front of the face, um, and it moves energy around the whole body, and it helps with pain around the whole body. So this is a really great acupuncture point just to get in there and just give it some massage. So it's between the pointer finger and the thumb, there's this web, and it's kind of right in the middle of there, right? So right there, so you can just get in there, just rub it, you might find a little tiny tender spot, and you can just hold that spot. <laughs> um, it means that there's either an excess or deficiency, or that's just a good place to move energy from. Mm -hmm. And the next point is do 14, so like right where a t-shirt collar would lay on the neck. This is a, so this point was the, the command point of the front of the face. This point is kind of the command point of the back of the neck. The, the front of the face and the back of the neck are portals for like cold to get into the body and cause disharmony. So you can, you can just rub that area there and you, you, again, you might find a tender spot, but that's a really great place to just rub and really connect in with. You just rub your hands together and get them warm. You can place them on there. Just keep that warm, and then when you're done, put your scarf on. Keep that heat in, because that's a precious gift you're giving yourself. Um, stomach 36, you have your kneecap, and then if you just rest your hand at the bottom of the kneecap, again, these are, it's not a... It, well, it is an exact science if I'm doing acupuncture. If you're just doing self-massage, it's not that big of an exact science. And just along the side here, you can just rub right in there. And this point here actually stimulates the immune system. And it helps with digestion. And digestion's really important because that's where we get our nutrients from, right? And that's what we're doing in the winter is we're storing our nutrients. So stomach 36. On the outside of the, so four finger widths below the kneecap on the, on the lateral side, the outside of the shin bone, there's a muscle there and the point's right in the muscle, right in the head of that muscle, the big part of the muscle. It's a pretty big area. And again, you might find a small soft uh, spot that's like kind of mushy or tender. And then spleen six, if you go to the inside of the leg and then just above the ankle and on the back side of the shin bone, if you rub down that line there, you might find a tender spot. This real tends tender. to be real tender. This tends to be really tender on people. And this, um, this point here, it helps moderate water in the body. And again, it moves all of the energy in the body. So it's a really great point for just keeping movement in the body. And the last acupuncture point, acupressure point, because you guys are doing pressure, um, that I listed was kidney three. And this one is um, on the inside of the ankle. You have the ankle bone here. And between the ankle bone and the tendon, there's that divot right here. 
right? Between the ankle bone and the tendon, there's a divot right there. And if you just get in there and rub that, that helps move the kidney energy around the body. So it's a really great point for winter because it helps um, keep the water moving and nourishing everything so that we don't become contracted and rigid. You know, I, would, I think five minutes twice a day is a really good general rule of thumb for these um, acupuncture points. The, all of these acupuncture points are very gentle, very effective. Then we think about some other things that happen in the winter. We eat, right? In the winter time, it, so that it's like, it's so dark and we just want light. So we go and we go to these parties and we eat and we have fun. Well, food is really important. In the winter time, it's important to eat very warming foods. So I made a ginger tea, ginger honey tea. Ginger's great, it's warming, cardamom. I listed a bunch of foods in there that are great to eat. You wanna eat foods that are warming. You wanna start to um, do, make dishes that Put, you put more time into cooking. Roasted root vegetables, stews, soups, mm, winter food. So the way that you cook your food, you're putting heat into it. And then you could have warmer foods. Um, let's see, what did I list here? And there's also black beans, kidney beans, right? So the, just like each of the elements relate to a sound and an organ and a season, they also relate to a color. So foods that are kind of black or dark blue in nature tend to tonify the kidneys more. So we have black beans, um, kidney beans, and then, you know, what do foods look like? Walnuts actually look like the kidneys, right? They also kind of look like the lungs. So walnuts tonify the kidney and the brain, the kidney, the lung, and the brain. Yeah, walnuts. My teacher always said, five walnuts a day, Michelle, five walnuts a day. And I mean, the oils, walnuts are great. They're really good stuff. So the foods you want to avoid are cold foods, raw iced drinks, because those contract. And oh, it's already cold in the winter, so we don't want to put any more cold in our body, right? We're trying to achieve balance. When it's cold and damp outside, we want to encourage warmth and not dryness, but not dampness. We don't want excess damp, so we don't want to eat a lot of the dairy and the foods that cause dampness in our body. Glutinous rice, white rice is glutinous. The rices that um, uh, that when you cook it, it gets kind of gooey. So a lot of the white rices, as opposed to the wild rices, that um, aren't really, they don't have that stickiness to them. Yeah, sticky rice is, is more something that you could eat like in the summertime when you want to hold on to that. Why vinegar? Uh, vinegar is kind of astringent. It's, it contracts, Apple right? Ha ha ha, apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar is more of a neutral vinegar. Yeah, so, so vinegar is on a food to, to avoid during winter. Yeah, because it's, it's more cooling and it's kind of astringent, so it's kind of like, it's kind of contracting. And this is Chinese medical theory, right? So Chinese medical nutrition. What about balsamic? Yeah, the balsamic vinegars tend to be a little bit more, uh, they also are astringent. Lemons are, are more neutral, yes. Because they're cold. If you steamed the spinach, that would be okay. But you, the, if like cold, raw vegetables, when you take them into your body, it takes heat and warmth to digest them. So in the winter months, you want to avoid anything that's going to utilize that heat. Um, the other thing is lifestyle. Just like in general habits that you can have, washing your hands, getting plenty of sleep, which is one we talked about, um, reducing stress in any way that you can. It's really important because what does stress take? Stress takes like mental and emotional thought to process, and that's an expenditure of our energy that in the winter months we really want to start conserving that. Um, and then I 
talk about that cold shower thing that I saw a couple people shudder on. Um, right now is actually re a really good time to um, expose your body to cold showers. Um, at the end of it, you can take a warm shower, and then at the end, if you just take a little bit of cold, it it contracts the exterior to keep the warmth in, and it actually stimulates the immune system. So just keeping warm, again, like warming the kidneys, keeping a scarf around your neck, because like the front of the face, the back of the neck, and the kidneys here, and then the bottom of the feet, those are the places where the warmth tends to really come into our bodies the most. So being mindful of that is really important. Um, really fluid movements. You know, if you go for walks in the morning, don't walk like this. Try to walk with, like, you know, with really fluid, long, slow, gentle movements. What's that? Yeah, lengthening exercises and strengthening are really good right now. And just taking time to really listen and recharge, really important. Um, the last thing in my handout is the list of herbs. Yay, I love the herbs. Um, and I started with a couple different Chinese medical or Chinese formulas that are really popular. Yu Ping Feng San, which is the jade windscreen, which this is the, the palace of jade is the back of the neck, and so it's the jade windscreen is the name of the formula. Astragalus is the main herb in it. So it really protects the back of the neck um, and keeps the pathogens out of the body, keeps that outer energetic field strong so that viruses and pathogens can't enter into our bodies. Um, and then there's some herbs that y'all may be a little bit more custom to astragalus, um, elderberry, which is one of our natives and our native plants. A lot of people make syrups out of that, and it's just it's really great to keep your immune system going. Echinacea, um, olive leaf, really great for um, supporting immune function and providing antioxidant support. And oregano, which helps support he healthy digestion and flora. So that's it for my handout. I hope that I've provided you with some really simple, elegant thoughts on how to um, boost your immune system for the winter as we're here in fall and moving into winter. Questions? One of the herbs that I listed there is astragalus. And astragalus is called an adaptogen. And so it's not necessarily an, inner, an herb that's going to give you a boost of energy, but it'll help you to adapt to stress. And over time, it'll strengthen your whole being. So astragalus is really great. I think I like astragalus um, really. It's an adaptogen, so it helps the body to adapt to whatever is draining your energy and it helps to strengthen the body so over time really gently it gives a good energy you know there's other herbs and things like um, like uh, there's like caffeine which just like gives a quick burst but then it's actually depleting so you want to be careful with herbs that like give you energy because a lot of times they can just deplete you over time yes so um, I, I have olive leaf, and it's not exactly my favorite tea. Can you suggest things that would are compatible with olive leaf that wouldn't cancel out? With this? Yeah. Well, olive leaf is is as a tea is really very strong. So in capsules is good. Um, olive leaf. Uh, the antioxidant support, right? We have like, I think blueberries are really great antioxidant. We have like a lot of our wild berries here, here like huckleberries and, and blackberries are really good. And because they're fruits, they're, cult, they're cooling in nature, but you can make a compote and add them to uh, oatmeal. And that's a really great way to get that. Um, and then the anti, uh, the olive leaf really um, supports immune function, but it's also really, I'm not sure why you're taking olive leaf. It's also really good because it's a, it's antibacterial, antiviral. So elderberry, um, the elderberry also is a really good one for that. Mix it with the olive Because my question was that, you know, drinking it, uh, usually if you're going to really be drinking tea on a regular basis, you're going to be more likely to do it if it tastes good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, olive, and then it's not that olive leaf tastes horrible, but it's just like, meh. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just not that great. Mm -hmm. So you're wanting suggestions for a immune a boosting tea that you can drink. 
Uh -huh. um, well, to add to olive leaf. Yeah, mixed with tea. Uh -huh. Yeah, have you tried astragalus? It has a really sweet, earthy flavor. Yeah, you might want to try astragalus. I'm really a huge fan. Claudia, did you have, uh, do you have any? Do you have lemon balm? Perfect. Perfect, thank you, okay. Um, so lemon balm is a really great suggestion. Lemon balm is a really smart herb because, and it grows, it loves to grow around here. Um, and yeah, and tons of it. So you might want to try astragalus. And then if, uh, yeah, and I, I have some in the office and Mariposa has some, and Mountain Rose has some, and if, um, if you have any more questions, we can talk about that later, or if that, and give me some feedback if you, if you do get to try that. Skullcap is also in the mint family, and um, it's, a, it's a tonic, and it's an, it's, a, it's an adaptogen. It helps strengthen the body. It's also, it is really good for the immune system as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Skullcap's a great herb. Yes. Are you saying it would be good to put warmth on your neck once or twice a day? Um, yeah, um, it's great to, you know, the, the, what I, so what I'm saying more is that then putting warmth onto the neck is keeping the cold off of it is really the important part. Yeah, you, wanted, you do want to keep it warm, but even more important than like, yeah, keeping it warm is important. Keeping a scarf around your neck. But what you really want to, you want more than like, than putting, adding warmth to it is you want to just like keep your natural body warmth and keep, be sure to keep the wind and the cold and the damp and the drafts off of it because this is kind of like a portal in the Chinese medicine in our energetic system. There's kind of like this opening here where the wind can enter into the body. And so you want to just shield and protect. I don't know if you've ever felt the, the urge to Go like that and cover your neck, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Do you know what I just started doing about uh, a month ago? Because I get cold when I go to bed in my neck and my chest. And of course, I've tried scarves and you know, you've got all your blankets. And what I did, of course, I'm at an ample size in my hips. So I took a pair of my pajama bottoms. <laughs> And they wrap perfectly oh. around your oh. neck. There you go. <laughs> That's a great idea. Yeah, and the ja so the other place to keep warm is the low back. And the in Japanese culture, I forget the name of it, but what it is is it's a, a, a wool blanket that's about this big with a sash and you take the wool blanket and you put it up over your hips or over your kidneys and then you take the sash and you tie it and then you flip it down and there's an extra blanket that they wear on the kidneys to keep the kidneys warm. I have a t-shirt where I've pinned a piece of flannel right over the kidneys and wear that under my other undergar. And where did you get that? Was that an idea? Just something yeah, innate that you felt? Somebody so advising me to keep my kidneys warm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I knew that was a way to do it. So she said she pinned a piece of flannel into her shirt to keep her kidneys warm. Suzanne, did you have something? I have to ask you, what do you do when you feel like you're going to get sick? Uh-huh. <laughs> when I feel like I'm going to get sick, what I do is I make something called fire water. <laughs> Great question, yeah. So Mariposa makes fire water. So if I'm in town and I'm not at home with my little cabinet of herbs and things, I will go to Mariposa and get something called fire water. And basically that tea that I brought tonight, it had, I, I got a ginger root and I cut it up and I boiled it, or simmered it for a while. Um, and I added lemon and honey. But what the fire water is, is it's lemon, honey, cayenne pepper, and I like to use molasses because it has a lot of minerals that are bioavailable in it. And that fire water, I will drink that. And I make it hot with lots of cayenne pepper because it, it helps to sweat, right, and push that pathogen out. So I will drink a cup of the fire water and I will take a hot shower and I'll go to bed and put all my covers on and just like hunker down and I will sweat and just push that out. <laughs> What's up? Did you put ginger in it outside? 
Yeah. So lemon water, lemon, ginger, a sweetener. I like molasses or honey and cayenne pepper. Lemon water, and they do. Um, yeah, Mariposa, just like a, if I'm in town working and it's start to feel. Just, even if I just feel a little bit like low energy, I'll do that because it warms warms me from the inside and kind of gives me that vitality. Yep. If you can't stand anything hot like cayenne peppers, there's two other herbs that are really great that you could use to, that are diaphoretics that help you to sweat, and that is the yarrow flower and the elderflower. So yarrow flower and elderflower also get the body sweating. So bring the temperature up to a high heat, um, right? It, it kind of knocks the pathogen virus down, virus load down, and sweat. Great question. Thanks, Suzanne. My name's Michelle Jean Cummins. I'm a licensed acupuncturist, and I practice in the Little Lake Grange. Claudia is my office partner, and thank you so much to Avenues to Wellness for providing this phenomenal resource for our community. I really appreciate it, and thank you to all of you for taking the time to give the gift to yourself to come and learn. Hopefully you learned some things, and supporting Avenues to Wellness, a uh, really, really great resource for our community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.